Good morning. Welcome to Crossroads Community Church. We'd like to invite you to join us for our morning uh, message. If you would take your Bibles, turn on over to Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 6. This morning's message is going to be something new. Matthew 21, starting in verse 6 and going on to verse 11. If we read, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed out crying, cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Let's stop there for just a moment. As you're looking at this, this story unfold of Jesus traveling into Jerusalem, we're seeing something take place that has never taken place before in all biblical history. Here Jesus is coming into the city, but he doesn't come any longer as a prophet, but he comes as king. And he comes in and the people are so excited. They've heard about his ministry. They heard about what he's done. They come running out to see him. As a matter of fact, if you look at the story in John, John chapter 12, verse 13 tells us that they came running out to meet Jesus. If you continue in John and you look at verse 18, it says that they heard about the miracles he did in Bethany, that they heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead, and they wanted to come out and see Jesus. He comes into the city bringing excitement, bringing news, bringing hope, and the people come out to see him. But they don't just come out with a band. They don't organize a rally. They don't do any of that. This is a spontaneous moment where people come out and they lay their clothes at Jesus' feet so he doesn't have to come in on a dirty, dusty road. They cut palm branches down and they lay those down. These are wealthy people. These are, are people with great reputations. These are common people. And just like us being commoners, there are things that we have that others don't have. There are things that we do that others don't do, but we're just common, plain people. And this, these are the people who are welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem. And they're crying out, Hosanna in the highest. You know, when we come to church and we sing praises to God, we get excited, we clap our hands, and we go through the worship service. We don't do it just because it's traditional, though maybe some people do, do it for that reason. But we worship God because we are expecting him to do something wonderful. That's what these people were expecting in Jerusalem. They were expecting something wonderful, something amazing to happen. As Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. I want you to look here in scripture as we study the story a little bit deeper. You read in verse 10, it says, And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Now, something amazing about this verse in verse 10 is that it says the whole city was moved. Doesn't say the whole city was changed, but it says the city was moved. You know, when we come into church, it's easy to be moved by the service. Who wouldn't be? Anymore, churches have become so well-versed in having an incredible worship service and engaging us in a way where we feel that we can just lay everything down and come to Christ and bring our sins to Him. We are moved by the words of the Psalms by the melodies that, are, that accompany the words. We're moved by it. So the people were moved by the things that Jesus done. However, there were many of those in the city who were never changed. Jesus wants to come into our life, not just to make us feel good, but to change things in our life. He doesn't want us to stay where we were yesterday. The Apostle Paul even teaches us we cannot go off of yesterday's anointing. God wants us to give something that's going to change our entire lives. Turn it back on its head. And who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want a better family life than what we currently have? Who doesn't want a better situation than what we have? We do. But to get those things, it requires a change take place. 
And what you're seeing here is that while many people were moved, not many were changed at this point. And I say this because when you follow the story, only three days later, they crucified our Lord and Savior Jesus. They crucified. But here, they're moved and they're rejoicing and praising God. In verse 14, we read, Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant and they said to him, do you not hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. When Jesus comes into the temple, he sees everything that's taken place. If you read back a few verses, he sees where the money changers are cheating people. People are, are having to buy and sell and do different things in the temple. And it's making Christ angry. And he turns the money changers tables over. And then he looks over in the corner and there's a lame man. There's a blind man. I can't imagine how long this has gone on. How long in church have people seen those in need and walked past them, not even to glance over their direction? How many times have we seen someone who's hurting, but we don't know how to respond? Here they are in the temple. They're making sacrifices. They believe that God hears their prayer. They believe that God's going to forgive their sin. They believe the God that split the Red Sea, that brought the Hebrews out of Egypt. They believe that this God is the God who gave them the Ten Commandments. They believe that he's the God of Moses. They believe that he's the God of Elijah and Elisha. They believe that he did all these amazing things, that he defeated armies, that he performed miracles. They believe this. But here sits two men in the corner, a lame man and a blind man, who have no hope. They have no future. They're going to church. They're doing what they're supposed to do. They're being obedient to God. And yet there they sit and nobody's doing ministry to them. And then Jesus comes into the temple and he heals them. He reaches out his hand and he heals them. This is God saying, I'm doing something brand new. You're never going to worship the same way again now that I'm here. This is not sensationalism anymore. This is about making a real change, a life change, about making you different than you've ever been before and sending you forward with victory. That's what Jesus did when he came into Jerusalem. He took out the traditions and he put in change. And not just change for change's sake, but change that brings about a healing. And that's what he did in the temple. He brought healing. And then just like for us in church, when we feel the Spirit of God moving and the Spirit of God speaking to our hearts, people get excited. And there were children in the temple that see someone's life made better. And they start praising God for it. This is real praise. This isn't just the children saying, okay, now it's time to put on our program. Now it's time to do what the adults taught us to do. No. These are children saying, we saw a miracle. And we saw it at the hands of Jesus. And they reach up their hands and they say, Hosanna. Hosanna. And they're praising God. But then the chief priest, those who had seen these men suffering day in and day out, they don't look at what Jesus did. They look at how this is affecting their traditions. And it says that they become indignant. They become angry. And they start getting on to Jesus. Saying, are you not going to get on to these children? But Jesus answers in verse 16, as we read a few moments ago, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. God is telling us, I'm doing something new. You know, something I've said throughout the ministry for many years is if you want something you've never had before, then you're going to have to do something that you have never done before. You can't keep doing what you did yesterday. 
A lot of us make promises, but yet there's very little change to accompany those promises. And we say, what am I missing? What am I doing wrong? What, what, what can I change? You can start by serving God in a way that you've never served him before. There are people right now who are very upset and angry saying we should be in church because we need to worship God. Well, here's the thing. According to scripture, God says don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together. But he also teaches us that wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be in their midst. What are you looking for that you don't have? Because at this moment, God is telling you, I am in your home. I am with your family. And I want to speak to you. I want to change things in your life. This isn't about everybody else around you. Right now, it's about me and you. You are in your home and I am here with you. It's about me and you. And it's time that we get some things straight because I'm coming. And when I come, I want you to be ready. I'm not coming to Jerusalem this time. I'm coming to your home. And he wants to know, are you ready when I come? Now, like all of us, we miss being together. And I'm going to rejoice so much when I see my congregation come back to this church. I will be elated to see each and every smiling face. But in the meantime, I challenge you. Our walk for God is personal. And this is a time that you can go deeper in your faith than you have ever been before in your life. Notice these two men that we're talking about here. There is a lame man and a blind man who sat in that temple day in and day out. They never moved. Nobody raised a hand to help them. Nobody did a thing, but yet there was church there every single week. And these men sat. But when they had one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus, they no longer sat in a corner. He was no longer blind wondering what was happening. There was no longer a lame man wanting to get up and worship God but couldn't get up. Now there were two men made whole because they spent one-on-one -on -one time with the Savior, Jesus Christ, and they were never the same. So this is your time to spend one-on-one -on -one time with your Savior in a way that you've maybe never been able to do it before. A way for you to share Jesus with your children that you never did before. A way to bring Jesus into your marriage that you never did before. A way that you can bring Jesus into your life that you never had before. And you can be like these two men and be made whole so that when you come to church again, you will not be the same person. Therefore, the church will not be the same. There are many people right now, they're saying, Pastor, I don't know what's going to happen. The church may not be there when this is all over. Oh, I believe it will be. And I want to tell you right now, I believe that we will experience a great revival when it comes back. And here is why I say that. Because I do not expect to see the same congregation that was here when we left. I expect to see a congregation that's walking closer with Jesus, that's talking more to Jesus than they were at before, a church that knows its Bible better than it ever did before, a church that knows how to pray but in a way that it never knew before. I expect to see a revival break loose, not in the whole, but in the individual, which affects the whole. So that when we go out, we can share the message of Jesus Christ with such passion, with such fervor, with such dedication that the world will not be able to ignore it and lives will be saved through the power of Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed on the cross. If we go further in scripture, I want to take you over to Isaiah chapter 43, such a powerful chapter in scripture. And so full of the promises of God. But in Isaiah chapter 43, starting in verse 18 and going to verse 19, it says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make road a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. 
Verse 18. Do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old. God says he's doing a new thing. A new thing. God doesn't want you to look backwards. That's where all of us seem to be going right now. Saying, I remember back when we used to do this. Back when we used to have, have church in our, in our church building. I remember when we used to do all this. You know what? Here's the thing. We're going to get back to that. But right now we have to deal with what's going on today. Because I live it today. I got to deal with it right now. And this is what God tells me. If I'm constantly looking backwards, then I can't go forward. If I'm constantly looking at what's going on over here, then I can't get past of what happened back here. I can't do it. I can't do it. I, I've got to quit looking back at what used to be and I've got to start looking forward to what is. Jesus is what's set before me. Jesus is the goal that I'm pressing towards. And as I get closer to Christ, all this other starts fading away. Because I'm not the same man that was back here. I'm different than what I used to be. And God is telling his church. He's telling the people in Jerusalem. I am fulfilling prophecy. Here's what that means. When a prophecy is fulfilled, it's back here now. When it's fulfilled, it's back here. You can look at it to be encouraged. But it's already been completed. But when you look ahead. You're seeing what comes as a result of that prophecy being fulfilled. Jesus said, I've come to you, Jerusalem, on the colt on the foal of a donkey. As prophesied in Zechariah 9.9, I'm coming to you that way. Now that I'm here, let's get to work. Now let's get busy. Let's change some things. And that's when you start to see the blind and the lame being healed. That's when you start seeing the temple get cleansed. That's when we come back to Isaiah 43. And God's saying, I'm going to do a new thing. Behold, it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God's saying, I'm going to do something that's going to blow the socks right off your feet. And when he does it, we should shout and rejoice for our God is able to bring to life things that are dead. That's what this is saying even right here in verse 19 when he says, I will make rivers in the desert. He's saying, I'm going to bring something that was dead back to life. I'm telling you what, folks who are watching this video, I'm going to tell you something. There are in many respects where the church has been dead for a long time. I don't say that to be mean, but I say it for this one purpose. God's going to bring it back to life. We're not going to be a church that sits in four walls anymore. We're going to be a church that gets deployed. We're going to be going out to the neighbors, to the communities, to our officials, and we'll be giving them the hope of Jesus instead of sitting back and not doing anything. We're going to become active and be sharing the living gospel with people in a way that will change lives and win souls for the kingdom of heaven. We don't serve a dead Jesus. We serve a living Jesus. And he says, I'm going to bring the dead back to life. I'm going to do something brand new. It's going to start today. I'm going to make rivers in the desert. I'm going to make roads in the wilderness. I'm doing a new thing. And it's time that we get excited about what it means to be a Christian again. We're not Christian in name only, but we're Christian in attitude, in lifestyle, in promise. Now you may be watching this video saying, Pastor, you're just wanting to beat up on people. Oh, no, I am not. Oh, no, I am not. Because when you read in the New Testament, the, one of the greatest apostles in Scripture, the Apostle Paul, he states, he tells us according to the Word of God, he says that he is the chief of sinners. Paul's saying, I've made the most mistakes. I've done more things wrong than anybody else. If there's anyone that God needs to turn on his head and change everything and rewrite my story, it's me. Paul didn't say that to beat up on anybody. He wasn't going to beat up on anyone. Paul said that for the sole purpose to make it clear to every single Christian of his day, to every reader of his letter. He said it so that you know nobody has arrived. Nobody is perfect. So who am I to beat up on anybody? If it was just me, Christ would have still died on that cross. 
I didn't do anything so great that he wouldn't have to do it. He died for all of us. I'm not here to beat you up over anything you may be doing or have done. I'm here to share with you Jesus Christ and him crucified. To share with you the promise that comes through the shedding of his blood and the remission of sins. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, he didn't chase out the money changers because he hated them. He did it because he loved them. If they continued doing what they were doing, it was going to cost people. Spiritually, it was going to cost them. And it was going to cost them the precious gift of salvation. So he chases them out. And he starts doing the work that he should have been doing from day one. Or the temple should have been doing from day one. And that is ministering to those who are hurting. This is why I say so often during the week, Jesus loves you. It's because he does. He's not going to leave you where he found you, but he loves you. And he's going to give you the blessed hope of, of him. In 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 9, we read, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are, the, are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. When you read these verses, it makes it so clear what God wants for you. God has chosen you to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That doesn't sound to me like a put down at all. It doesn't sound like condemnation, but it sounds like a promise because it is a promise. This was the start of something new in Jerusalem. When Jesus comes in, yes, he turns a lot of things on their head because they needed to be. But he didn't do it because he hates the people. He did it because he loves them. There were things that he saw that were causing damage to the church, to his people. And he says, this is what I see for you. This is my plan, that you become a royal nation. A royal nation, a chosen generation. God says, that's what I choose for you. That's the start of what I'm getting ready to do. You may be someone who's so discouraged right now, watching everything with this pandemic unfold. I hope you're not, but you could even be somebody who's affected by the virus. You're saying, Pastor, what can you give me according to the word of God? What can you offer me? I can offer you this. My Jesus loves you with words that would fail me if I tried to explain it. My Jesus loves you. And he has never left you, nor will he leave you. But he has given you this promise. But if you will accept him, he will not leave you the same way that he found you. Just like in Jerusalem. He may have to change some things that are going on in your life. But he doesn't do it because he despises you at all. But he's doing it because you are so special to him. You are chosen. That's what the scripture says. You are chosen by God. And he's got a plan for your life. Don't give up on my Jesus. He has never given up on you. Nor will he. Because you've been chosen by God. You were created by him. That's the promise we have in these scriptures. That's the promise we see in the triumphal entry. God's people gave him every reason to walk away, and yet he never did. They gave him every reason to quit, every reason to believe it wouldn't change, and yet he would not move. But he stayed faithful, even to the point of the cross. In Hebrews, we read that he even despised the cross. He didn't want to go. But he went because he loves us. This morning, if you've been listening to this message and yet you say, 
I've never made a decision for Jesus Christ, and I want to make that decision, then I challenge you today to make that decision for Jesus Christ. You can know him as your personal Lord and Savior if you'll simply pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be my Savior. I believe that you were born of a virgin. I believe, Father, that you died on a cross for me. And I believe that you're coming back someday. Thank you, Father, for saving me. In your holy name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to tell you today that you are saved and you have a home in heaven. If you're someone you don't know where you stand with Jesus, I'm going to challenge you. Go to a prayer closet, go to a private room and have that time with Jesus. He loves you and he will listen to your prayer. If you're someone today, you just have a family member deep on your heart and you want to see God move in their life, pray for them. If necessary, even pick up a phone or call them. I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. And I know with certainty your Heavenly Father wants to hear from you. Thank you for watching this service. I pray it's been a blessing to you and your family. If you would like to support our church through prayer, then I, I ask you to continue to pray for this ministry. If you'd like to give financially, though it is not required, it's always appreciated. You can go to our website, crossroadsbedford.org. Just scroll down about the center of the page. You'll be given an opportunity to give through PayPal. And I know we would greatly appreciate anything you're willing to do in prayer or financial. God bless you, and thank you for watching this broadcast.